morning, everybody. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Are you happy to be in God's house? Let's give God a hand. Come on. You ready for the word? If you got a bulletin, you can take your sermon notes out. If you have a Bible, go to Daniel chapter 5. In, we're going to do a two-week series called Scandalous. We're going to talk about what is going on in the church. And we're going to talk about integrity and living a life of integrity. And we're going to touch on politics also. We don't talk about politics hardly at all. And so I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I'll tell you how to pray. And uh, we'll, uh, uh, we're going to go to an election that God had. And it's in Daniel chapter 5. Sometimes God weighs in, and we realize that he is always in control. And everybody said, amen. All right, who in here grew up in a family that you were passionate about politics? Okay, just a few of you. All right, who's sick of politics right now? There we go. Great. Just like, I've got a belly full. Now, my family was very passionate about politics. My grandfather was a diehard Democrat, loved Edwin Edwards, just loved everything about him being the governor of Louisiana. My dad was a stone-cold Republican, uh, part of the moral majority. He was always right, and my grandfather was always right. And they would go from the altar of the church to lunch. And I learned early in life, I could just lob up a simple question, like what's going on with the oil in the Middle East? And they would go from the altar to a knockdown, drag out fight in about five seconds. Amen. So we had a rule in our home, never talk about politics. But I just couldn't help myself. Amen. Super passionate. But I tell you, here's the deal. Politics is in your feed all the time right now because we're spending more money than we've ever spent campaigning. And so there's going to be $2 billion spent on this election. So when it's always in your feed, it can seem that it's way more important than it really is before God. And then it's become incredibly mean-spirited and vicious with everybody. And that's where I just got like my belly from. It's like, man, our civilization is losing its ability to be civil. So what do we do? What do you do as believers? Because I will tell you, there's never been more of a, uh, a time in history where things are very, very tense. This is what you do. You go right back to the Word of God. This is what the Bible says in Psalms 146.3. Do not put your trust in princes who are mortal men. They cannot save you. Let's all say that together. One, two, three. They cannot save save you. Now listen, they're all going to say that they can. They cannot, say it with me, they cannot save you. And I think what we're doing with pastors and with politicians, we're, we're beginning to idolize them instead of honor them. We're like, they're going to solve my problems. They're going to correct things. And so we begin to, um, we begin to put them in a place that only God is meant to be put in. Jeremiah says it this way, anybody who turns away from trusting me to put their trust in a human being will be cursed. What does he mean? If you put your, your trust in a human being, you're going to be let down. You're going to be hurt. You're, you're just things are, you're, you're going you're gonna to have your hopes hurt, your heart hurt. You're going to end up being very emotional about Politics, very emotional about things. So we go, I don't want to be led astray. What do I do? I put my hopes in the one perfect leader that walked this earth, and his name is Jesus. Everybody said amen. We've had one. So in my family, we were so passionate about politics, but at the end of the day, it didn't change my family. You know who's changed my family is Jesus Christ. And what changes our family, listen to me, is not a political figure, and it's not even a superstar in a pulpit. What changes the world is how you live for Christ in this world. Amen? Like when Jesus was on the side of a hill, he said, you and nobody else but you are the salt of the earth. And you and nobody else but you is the light of the world. This is what Jesus was saying. He was saying, I'm betting the farm on how you live for God. And the way this world is going to go is the way of your relationship with Jesus. Amen? So we, th you can have uh, people who are betting the farm on government. God's betting the farm on you. Saying, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Reflect who I am wherever you go. 
I was at another campus. I had a guy. He came up to me. He said, Marcus, it's just, it's hard for me to know that there are people in this church that vote differently than me. I said, really? I said, there's Republicans here. There's Democrats. Guess what? There's Libertarians. And then there's Green Party people. There's people who will never vote that attend this church. He goes, no. And I said, guess what? There's about a dozen people who died years ago, and they're still voting. We have all <laughs> kinds attending this church, right? So, <laughs> so one day, one day Joshua he saw an angel of the Lord, and Joshua was getting ready for battle, and Joshua walked up to the angel of the Lord, and he goes, are you for us, or are you for them? Now, this is a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament, and Jesus said, neither. I'm for God. I want you to know, like Jesus, when he comes back, he's not coming back to take sides. He's coming back to take over. Amen? And he goes, God is for God. Amen? And he will never let us down. His word is true, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But one day, God got tired of all of the pride and all of the immorality that he saw in Babylon. And he said, these governmental leaders are blaspheming my name, and I'm weighing in. And he weighed in in the middle of a party. And when he weighs in, we're going to look at this story, but there's some things that I want you to apply to your life for the season that we're in right now over the next 90 days while we're going into an election season. We go, how do I live for God? What are the things I need to prioritize right now in my life? So King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. And they brought in the gold goblets. They had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the kings and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared. Sooner or later, God weighs in. It's not that God's got his arms folded. His wheels of justice turn. They just turn on a different pace than we want them to sometimes. But God goes, I'm going to weigh in. Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote, and his face turned pale. And he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. I mean, this dude is just about ready to faint. The king called out for the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners to be brought and said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means, whoever does that, will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. First thing I want to tell you this is this. You can read something and see something and not know what it says right? There are some things that only the children of God are going to understand when we move towards the end times. So they see it. Everybody sees it. This finger is writing in Greek, and they go, we know the words. We can say the words, but we don't know what they mean. So can somebody tell me what is going on? Because this is the hand of God. What is he saying? So let me tell you this. The most important thing you do right now is humble yourself and have a teachable spirit. You don't want God to be speaking and you not be able to hear and heed what he is saying. So they bring the one guy in. His name is Daniel. And they actually changed his name. And they changed his name to another meaning that, that meant this. Save the king with your wisdom. And listen to me. I think that would be a great little tagline for your life. You get so close to God, you walk in wisdom, and you help people with the wisdom God's given you. Amen? You keep growing in things. Save the king with your wisdom. So Daniel comes up to him. He goes, you know what? I'm going to tell you the, the problem is you're full of pride. And your daddy, Nebuchadnezzar, he lost his mind because of pride. 
And he, he traveled the earth like an animal and ate from grass for seven years. And you haven't humbled yourself. Verse 23, instead, you've set yourself up against the Lord. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you. And you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze, iron, wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote this inscription. Verse 25. This is the inscription that was written. Mine, mine, tekel, parson. And then Daniel begins to explain. And I want us to take some notes. He said, this is what these words mean. Mine, this is what it means. God has numbered the days of your reign. And brought it to an end. Here's the first principle I want you to write down and take home. Our days are numbered. There's a, there's a number to our days. And I think God wants you to live knowing that your days are numbered. And they're fewer than you think they are. Listen to me. Anything that we have an abundance of in our mind, we will squander it. Isn't that the truth? It's this way with Milo's tea at my house. We get the Arnold Palmer tea. We buy it two gallons at the time. I don't care. Those kids go through that first gallon in about 10 minutes. But it's that second gallon. When we get about halfway through the second gallon, then daddy's got to weigh in. I'm like, hey, everybody's drinking water from now on. Because when you got two gallons, everybody can drink anything. When you're down to half a gallon, that's daddy's gallon. That's half, daddy's half gallon. Anything that you have an abundance of, you squander it. And listen to me, anything you believe like this is limited for me, then you know what you do? You begin to use it in a wise way. Our days are numbered. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, man is destined to die once <laughs> Some of you are like, I came on the wrong Sunday. All right. Man, <laughs> this is a verse that's never made it to a refrigerator. I've never been in a house, you know. And they're like, we got a painting of this. The man, <laughs> man is destined to die once. And after that, face judgment. Like, that gets no, nobody's texting that in an encouraging verse in the morning, right? We don't, we, we don't want to think about it. God wants you to think about it. One time, this has been years ago, we did a series around new life, and we just basically had this one idea. If you had 30 days to live, what would you change about your life? So many of you in this room, you've had a brush with death. Some of you were in military. Some of you have had a report from a doctor, and it just made you go, whew, how much longer do I really have? You, you start seeing the brevity of life. This happened to Brooke in 2015 when she was diagnosed with cancer. We just, we got blindsided and we went, oh, our life, our days are really, really numbered. What you think about that? If you had 30 days to live, what would you do? And you're like, I'm going to live life to the full. I'm going to go skydiving and Rocky Mount climbing 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm going to do all of it. <laughs> I, I remember a few years ago, me and the campus pastor in Fort Smith, well, uh, we, we went whitewater rafting, and the water on the Rio Grande was the highest it had been in 50 years. So we got this God named Billy, and, and you, this, everybody needs a God named Billy. Uh, Billy lived in a van down by the river. No joke. So him and his wives would take care of us. See, I had several. And, uh, and they, 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 they worked the raft. Well, we got into the raft, and he was like, hey, he's, and I looked back at Billy. Billy was smoking a doobie on the back of the raft. And I said, Billy, everybody's wiping out ahead. He said, that's a class five rapid. I named it Godzilla. And I said, well, well what do we do? He said, just try to live through it. And that was his advice. Here's the photo of us going through this five. You can see me. I'm actually about to bail into the bottom of the boat. Because when we got to the top of the rapid, we had to just paddle through it. He's like, you got to paddle through this. And then this old prophet came up in my mind. And he said, uh, you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. I folded. Amen. So <laughs> you take that off. 
But I remember thinking, God, if you get me out of this, I will never be stupid again. Amen? I mean, you look at your life. This is, this is how David said it in Psalm 39. Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. You've made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a, a breath. That's all our life is. He says, I want you to live. Here's a, here's a principle for you. Write this down. Live with a sense of purpose. God has a plan for your life, and he wants you to live with a fire somewhere in your belly. That you get up out of bed and you go, God has a purpose for me, and I'm right in the middle of it. Belshazzar was wasting his life all the way to the grave. See, some people go, well, I, there are some things I'm aiming at doing in my life. Pull the trigger. Stop aiming and just say, God, you've given me a, a plan. You have a purpose for my life. I want to be right in the middle of that plan and that purpose. You're not an accident. And you're not here just to take up space. God has a call. He has a will for your life. And when, you're, when you know that your days are numbered, you go, i got to get serious doing the things that God has called me to do with my life. Our days are numbered. Here's the second word, tekel. Tekel means you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. He's like, I, I've weighed the spiritual side of your life. This is what God was telling Belshazzar. He's like, your life, I took what you do and how you live. And the spiritual side of your life is too light for me. Amen? Do you know that God can weigh us exactly right? Right? Do we have a scale? Would you hand me that scale? This is, this is what I think is probably one of the most embarrassing things about going to the doctor. They're going to weigh you every time. You know what I'm saying? And I never, like any time I weigh, I'm like, hey, babe, would you just go, go over here? We're going to get. And then when I weigh and they put me on the scale and I get there, I always feel like i got to explain what happened. I was like, you know, <laughs> I had some Mexican food and... Uh, some of this is muscle. Uh, <laughs> golly, this is terrible. Anybody want to come up and weigh? All right, no. You don't because it's like, it's so embarrassing. And God goes, I'm going to tell you something embarrassing. I've been weighing your life, and I weighed your spirit, and you've been found wanting. There is not the weight of who I am is not living in your soul. The Egyptians would cut your heart out of your chest and weigh it to tell you what kind of man you were. But God says it's not your physical heart, it's your spirit. And your spirit is too light. But this is what God was saying is, th this actually meant your life is way out of balance. You got some things in your life that you've got not enough of the things of God and way too much of other things fill in your life. Does that make sense? It was a scale. He's like, I've weighed your life on a scale like this scale. And I have found that the things in your life that's going to live forever, there's nothing to it. But the things in your life that are temporal, man, you've weighed your life down with these things. And today, I'm calling you into an account. So here's the principle. Our lives get out of balance when we don't weigh our lives in our, in our quiet time with God. Like you need to get before God and just say, God, where am I at? Do I have too much worldliness in me? Not enough godliness in me? Do I have too much work and not enough rest? <laughs> or some people too much rest and not enough work? Where, where am I out of balance in my life? Do I have too much play and not enough purpose? Too much uh, isolation and not enough godly relationships in my life? Ephesians 5 says this, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit of God. And everybody said amen. Amen. How do you do this? You get before God, and David would routinely do this in a quiet place. But I love Psalm 139. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. 
Isn't that a great conversation with God, just a cry of your heart? This is his heart cry. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me. What's he saying? Would you weigh my life? I don't want to go through life thinking that my life is strong and I've got it all together. Because listen to me. Belshazzar was so confident into how he was living his life. He was like, I got this. I can do anything I want to with my life. Until the moment God weighed in and said, I got some things to write about your life. And he said, your life is totally out of balance. You've been weighed and found wanting. Search me, oh God, know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen? The last one, Perez. This is this parson. Daniel chapter 5, verse 28 says, Perez, your, this is what it means. He's explained it to him. Your kingdom is divided and giving to the, given to the Medes and the Persians. And that very night, another empire comes, comes into being. It's over that night. He's like, the kingdom's been divided. Would you write this down? God has given me some warning signs. And Belshazzar had a lot of warning signs. Prophets came to him. People wrote things. They were speaking to his life prophetically in his life. And he ignored every word that came from God. You've got some warning signs too. There's some warning signals of your life. You ever had those warning signals where you're just like, you know what, something's off in my soul. You got to pay attention to the warning signals of your life. Like, I'm getting mad too easy. You know, my emotions are inconsistent. You go home, and your dog doesn't know what to do. Your cat does because your cat's weird. But your dog doesn't know what, nobody knows what to do. It's just like I'm inconsistent emotionally. Or maybe you have secrets in your life, and you're like, I got some hidden things in my life. That, that needs to be an alarm that goes off and just say, there are things about me I wouldn't want the people that I love to know about my life. Those are warning signals. Some of you are stressed all the time. That is a warning signal going off. Worry is a warning signal in your life. Something's out of balance. Something is off. There's something there. i got to make some adjustments. So he's being prophesied. You know, it, when, when climbers climb Mount Everest, when you get Mount Everest is 29,000 feet to the summit. At 26,000 feet, you enter a death zone. Nothing there can live. Now, I've climbed a few mountains before, and I, I did a 14,000-foot mountain. I uh, did Pikes Peak in Colorado with one of the pastors at our church. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, I got up above tree line, and the air got so thin. It was me and James Bennett. He pastors our Cabot campus. We got up there, and then I got delirious. I started seeing unicorns, and I was talking to squirrels. You know, it was just, I was like, what's going on? He was like, so, you know, he basically had to carry me to the top of that mountain. We made it down. He's got stories. They're not true, but he's got stories. But I was like, what is going on? And he goes, you are higher than the oxygen your body was asking for. This happens in our life. Like, your life can be in a death zone right now relationally because you don't have enough spiritual oxygen. You can have, be in a death zone with your dreams or a death zone with the will of God happening in your life. And you're like, what's going on? I don't have the amount of oxygen. What do I need to do? Number three, pay close attention to what the Lord is speaking right now. Lean in. Ask God to help you. Lean in and say, God, what are, what are you trying to speak and say to me? There are some warning signs that you have from my, I need to lean in to what you're saying. I wrote a few of these down. I'm living too close to assume. My emotions are inconsistent, less productive, less focused. It's that last one. I'm just not hearing from God. I'm not, I'm not hearing from him when I'm riding down the street. I'm not hearing from him like, it's like something has been turned off. I'm not hearing from him in, the, in church. Those are some warning signs for you to go, there's an adjustment I need to make. So when God weighed in and he wrote, he was just letting them know, your days are numbered. You're out of balance. And you missed every caution light I've placed in your life. I don't want to be Belshazzar. Amen. Amen.